And time now for Newsmakers. And joining us for a look at what's made the headlines this week are Romilly Maju, who's the Chief Executive of the Green Building Council, and Julian Lisa, who's the Executive Director of the Menzies Research Centre. Thank you so much for coming in and speaking with us today. Let's kick off with the Ryan Giggs affair. And, of course, he's the Manchester United football star who took out an injunction against the media to prevent reporting of an alleged extramarital affair. His name was freely discussed on Twitter. He was then named in Parliament under privilege and of course he wanted to sue Twitter initially because of the revelations and I believe he's got a very big football match coming up this weekend. First of all, I wonder if I can start with you Romilly, how much privacy should celebrities be entitled to? I'm not sure it's just celebrities. I think it's everybody has a right to privacy. And the concern with what's happened with Twitter and also Wikipedia released four celebrities' names on who had super injunctions as well is really everybody's right. And the abuse of um, the you know power of not only Twitter but other forms and the bullying that might involve or whatever. So really I think it's everyone's right, whether they're celebrity or not. Okay, Julian, do you share the same view? Yes, I'm, I'm in favour of, uh, of privacy generally. I, I think that uh, there's an issue here with these super injunctions. It's a particularly British thing because of the UK Human Rights Act, which we don't have in Australia except for in Victoria, where there's a right to privacy and a right to the family life. And that's how um, Ryan Giggs was able to get this injunction. You wouldn't be able to achieve that in Australia. But the idea that Twitter can somehow subvert the court processes, I think, is wrong. And I'm not sure they could get away with that here. So it really shows that the law needs to catch up. Twitter wasn't around three or four years ago, and other forms of social media are moving really, really quickly. But how, example, does a social networking site stop people discussing things? Well, uh, under Australian law, there's that Goodnick case, you, which you'll remember if uh, a person has a substantial reputation in a particular place and they bring an action in that place, despite the fact that the tweet may have gone on in another place, they have a right to sue, um, as, it, as it may be the Twitter company here. Take this example with Ryan Giggs. If a media outlet which had the super injunction imposed upon it, if one of its journalists had access to Twitter account and decided to tweet this information, that I think would have been a real subversion of the rule of law. And I think it's important uh, that uh, journalists not be allowed to get around this by putting things out surreptitiously on Twitter. And I think Twitter should be um, responsible for these matters. Well, in this case, I don't think it was necessarily journalists no, no, who put the information no, out on Twitter. Twitter. And, of course, this MP came over the top of everybody and revealed this information under parliamentary privilege. It's a bit what? of an abuse of that parliamentary privilege. I, I don't think there's, a, uh, th there's anybody who disagrees with that view. Um, parliamentary privilege is a safeguard, and this was just flaunting uh, it completely. Now, it wasn't just... I actually was in the UK last week, and it wasn't just um, gigs, and this happened before gigs. It was also the former CEO of the Bank of Scotland. There was an MP who also did the same about parliamentary privilege, and the head of the Bank of Scotland, I think his name was Sir Fred Goodwin. So what do you think's going on here? Why are parliamentarians wanting to, 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 to out people, so to speak? Well, he said because Goodwin was having an affair when the Bank of Scotland was falling apart, and it was people's right to know what was happening in his social life that had an impact, such a huge impact, which the government then had to bail out. So the MP was saying it, they, he felt that everyone, the public, had the right to know that. Well, that was his view. But, you know, I think... We've just got to be sure and careful around everyone's right to know and the privacy of public. OK, we might move on to the next issue. During the week, the Climate Commission released its latest report. Here's the head of the Commission, Professor Tim Flannery. It's clear from the report that the evidence is becoming more convincing year by year. It was always very good, you know, even back in 2007. But uh, for Australia, we're seeing the impacts more clearly. We're seeing the sea level rise that was, was predicted. We're seeing the decline in rainfall continue, particularly in the southwest of Western Australia. We're seeing impacts on the Great Barrier Reef and so forth. That's Tim Flannery there. Well, the Coalition has already disagreed with the report. Again, if I can start off with you, Romilly, what's your reaction to the discussion so far? The report is important in the policy debate in Australia. We need to have the debate and we need to challenge each other's thinking, but we need to also hear from the science. One of the things that was fascinating about the Coalition's response is if you look at what's happening in the policy debate in Europe and in the UK, 
there is a bipartisan response to what is happening on climate change policy. And we used to probably have more of that in Australia than we do now. It seems to be that on two issues, one, the coalition need to get their house in order around what their policy actually is. And two, we need the report is important. It is poor, important as part of the policy debate that we're having at the moment. Julian, Lisa, what about Romley's point about the bipartisan need to get behind these reports? Well, I'm not really sure what the purpose of this report was. If the purpose of the report was to discuss the science, we've had those discussions and uh, people have made up their minds. The real debate now is around the carbon tax itself and it's the government's carbon tax. There's a lot of debate as to, uh, you know, how, how it's going to be imposed, who's going to get uh, carve-outs and so on, and uh, that's where the debate should focus. I just think this report is a bit of a diversion and an unhelpful one. At that. Romilly, is that a point, that, that the focus now should be really on the carbon price, the carbon tax? I think the, the focus still is on the carbon price and the carbon tax, and when the report came out, it seemed to be that it all diverted back to discussions around the carbon price. Um, and so what, where I was coming from is we need a whole lot of different um, reports around because I'm not sure everybody in both business and industry is across everything they need to be across. And one of the issues is the communication around the carbon price and its impact and the discussion on different industries. We actually need to have more of that, but they also need to understand the long-term effects that could happen on their industry. So if you look at the report, for instance, one of the – there's some really, you know, diamonds in there – is the issue of adaptation. It is saying that it's warming and that we need to look at the adaptation of our cities. Now, that then feeds back into the policy discussion around the price on carbon and where we're going. So that's where I think these reports are important, but we seem to be losing sight of where they fit in the debate. Well, I mean, I think on the price on carbon and, and in terms of, you know, what are the alternative policies, I think the Coalition's got its alternative policy out there in relation to soil carbons and so on, but there's still a lot of discussion as to uh, whether you saw the Business Council this week saying they thought $10 is, was a reasonable price, the Greens are talking $40. We are a and long way from a carbon price. And this does carbon. have um, the ability to confuse the public, as, as we well know. If I can just ask you, though, the UK government, as Romilly's just returned from the UK, the UK government committed to slashing emissions to, uh, by 50% of 1990 levels by 2027. I believe that's about 10 times what the Australian government has committed to. Why can the UK government do that, but we can't? And one of the other things that's important to note is it's legally binding. So the UK government, when they made this announcement, which was made, we were actually with the Director of Energy and Climate Change the week that the announcement was made. It's a legally binding announcement. And what is fascinating in the UK is you have a new government that's come in who has followed the position of the former government, the former Labor government, and not only that, strengthen the climate change policy around that with the Green Investment Bank, the Green Deal and the whole focus that they're doing on refurbishment because the UK understand the enormity of what they're dealing with. But the British economy is very different to the Australian economy. It's not uh, to do with the uh, economy though, well, is the, it? Because it's to do with the leadership. Well, David no, Cameron has always been a bit of a greenie. Uh, look, I, I don't doubt that, but I think the industries are very different in Britain to Australia and we are such a, a country that's dependent on our mining industries on our steel production in industries and so on. Britain has some steel production. We've got a lot more than they do. Um, the effect of doing something along the lines of what the government's proposing would wipe out towns, would wipe out industries. Uh, I think you can get away with things in Britain because you've got a different uh, uh, economic environment than what you do here. The other thing is there's been a lot of criticism as to how the government in Britain is actually going to achieve their targets. There's, it's still quite unclear. Um, I think when we talk about an international consensus on action here, it's actually about seeing big emitters actually take steps and implement things and, and see those programs actually run out before Australia gets involved. That's what we okay. mean. But then right. one of the, the issues is the UK economy at the moment is actually quite slow compared yeah, to the it's Australian it's economy. So it showed bold leadership by the UK government to actually implement such a policy during the fact that they've got a slow economy. Another point I'd just like to challenge, though, is Australia is very reliant on peak oil and on the resources industry. There is going to have to come a time when we look at changing our economy. And the, these industries are fully aware we've been having these debates. Howard brought in the discussion about the ATS many years ago. Why aren't these industries responding to that quicker than they, than they are? 
Romilly, just, just back on the UK for a second. The UK Treasury was very concerned about the effect of these new policies, yes, yep. particularly because the economy is so weak there. And look, you know, this is a national interest question for Australia. What are we really good at doing? We are particularly good uh, at things in the resources sector. We're particularly good at extracting our natural resources. That's where our competitive advantage is. We shouldn't be putting that. We shouldn't be putting Australian jobs at such a disadvantage but, when but other can countries I, Can I just break in there? We forward. were going to move on to something else, but let's stick on climate change because it is fascinating. If we constantly say that there are things blocking our path, how can we ever move forward? Surely we have to make the decision to change and move on from there, Julian. My view is very simply that if China, if Brazil, if America actually do things of the sort that we're talking about, it's at that point that we should become a fast Isn't follower. Isn't that a blinkered approach it's to not say a blinkered they approach. act first and then we act? No, it's not a blinkered approach. Sometimes it's useful to be the first out of the blocks in terms of emitters. Other times it's useful to actually benefit from the particular te uh, technology changes and uh, uh, economic models that have been produced by, by other countries. Considering that we are responsible for less than 1.5% of global emissions, I think it's in our national interest to very much be a fast follower in this regard. Okay. And I would say very quickly, that China please. and the US are actually leading in some of these areas We're and Europe. No, well, I've been to China a number of times and I have seen what they are doing and they are beating us in renewable. Ernst & Young report this week, China is out in front okay. on renewables. Renewables a long way from actually implementing We're going to run out of time in a few seconds, but thank you very much for coming in for such a great discussion today. We appreciate it. Thank you.